So let me introduce John McLean is the Maine DEP Nonpoint Source Training Center Coordinator. And he does these workshops all the time. His calendar is very full. Very full. Thanks, John. Thanks, John, for doing yeah. this workshop for us. Oh, absolutely. Um, so hi everybody. I'm John McLean. Um, as Medea mentioned, I'm work for Maine DEP and I do non-point source training. And so I'll get a little bit into that. Um, just just to keep things moving, because I tend to, this is actually a, a shorter version of a four-hour class that includes field components where, you know, we'd actually go and sort of identify a lot of these features on actual roads and kind of look at the, the greater landscape context of some of them. But um, just to help keep it shorter so we can get to as many questions as possible, um, yeah, we'll answer questions at the end, but if you are afraid as we're as I'm talking about something that you're gonna forget the question or that we won't get to it at the end, feel free, I think, to to put in the chat your question just so at the end we can make sure we go through everybody's things. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess we'll get going here. Um, so I've been doing a lot of, so I work uh, in DEP's commissioner's office. And so a lot of what I do is outreach and guidance, um, technical assistance to a degree, and and mostly through training um, of contractors and municipal officials and um, engineers and a whole bunch of other folks that are involved with work in or near resources. And so gravel roads are one of the things that we, we provide some additional training in as a specialty um, because gravel roads, as many of you know, can be a, a pretty big source of, of nutrients and, and other um, issues to water bodies in Maine. So um, let's see. So you may have seen this slide before, but essentially this is a really good encapsulation of, of sort of the concept of non-point source pollution and particularly with lakes how things from the land and, the, and what we do on the land has an impact on water quality has an impact on habitat um, and and frankly just changes to the the landscape within a particular land area that drains to a lake for instance can um, really show up in, in damage or degradation and so non-point source pollution roughly is, is really diffuse sources of pollution. So, you know, in the past, there was a really big effort and a lot of success at removing point sources of pollution where the exact classic example is just some sort of pipe that's from a factory dumping into a waterway. But one of our biggest things now that we're dealing with is actually the, what we call non-point source pollution or diffuse pollution from the land that you can't necessarily track to one specific point that's really coming from everywhere. And so all these little pieces add up and um, to the water body in a way, um, it's, it's a damage or, or I hate to say death, but it's like that um, classic death by a thousand cuts. Um, that's all these little, little pieces that over time really start to impact our resources. And um, so DEP is charged with, with protecting resources is one of the things that we do. Um, and so, there are a lot of resources out there and uh, it doesn't really take much of a drive to go past many resources, even on probably your, your local road um, or your, your private road. Um, there's, there's interactions with our built environment and resources all over the place. So just sort of by the numbers, Maine has some pretty spectacular resources let alone by quality, how amazing many of us know our, our main resources to be. So a lot of what we talk about is prevention of degradation of these resources because um, we do see impacts across the state um, to these resources, but a lot of our, our resources are in, are in pretty good shape and we want, we want to try and keep them that way. Um, Maine has about 6,000 lakes and ponds in the state. Um, which is more than the rest of New England combined. Uh, we have about 45,000 miles of rivers and streams. Um, you know, and, and for my normal classes, I, I use the example of, you know, just think about how many times you went over a stream crossing to get to whatever location you're going. 
And you, you often don't notice how many of those, um, you know, direct interactions or we cross resources or put a resource through a, a pipe and essentially under the road. Um, we have 5 million acres of freshwater wetlands in the state, which is about a quarter of the land area of the state of Maine. And they're really, really important features for, um, for wildlife habitat, for groundwater recharge, for um, sequestering of nutrients and, and other pollutants. So there's a lot of different things that those, those uh, wetlands are doing. Um, to protect water quality as well. And they can be degraded often by soil and other things making to, to them. Um, we have a, over 150,000 acres of coastal wetlands, salt marshes. Um, and, you know, it depends on where you, you get the, the numbers from, but we've got about 3,500 miles of coast, um, depending on what scale you, you sort of measure it at. But by those numbers, we have, there's just a ton of stuff out there. And, um, you know, we tend to, as people to want to live near water. Um, and so often uh, a lot of these developments start out and uh, build away from the water through historical patterns as well. Um, one way that they there may be additional, um, I guess, way to, to frame how much interaction we have with these resources is how, much, how many roads we have in the state. And so roads are a fairly major way in which we change the hydrology, change the patterns of water movement across the landscape from a natural, say, forested condition, which is most of Maine would be in that kind of category. Um, so 30,000 miles of road, a, a primary feature of roads is to provide drainage um, and continued function of that roadway. So if we think about the, the ditches and the other elements of the road as um, receiving a lot of that water that will then make its way to the low spot. You know, most of these resources are what you're going to find at those low spots. And so in the past, we always just thought, well, we're trying to get this water off the land as quick as possible. We'll get it to where it wants to go, which is the, you know, where the, the stream is or where the wetland is, not really thinking about what was in the water. And so if you any of the, the lake association folks will be very knowledgeable about this already likely um, but soil is really the biggest pollutant to Maine's waters um, by volume and a lot of that is sped up by human activity um, and development in addition to just actively disturbing soil just the features we have on the land and, and anyone with a gravel road after these last couple storms probably has some stories about, um, you know, how that stuff can actually move quite a, quite a ways from where they originally were supposed to be. So all of that soil is really a, a mechanism to bring nutrients and other pollutants to the water that can affect uh, the algae and other things in the water body, um, basically making nutrients available to, to start an algae bloom and so while soil is is one of the it is the leading contributor of phosphorus to to waterways it's not the only one there are many sources but one of the the interesting things about phosphorus is it is trapped for it fairly well by soil um, it reacts a lot with soil particles so it usually takes the soil particle moving in order to bring that phosphorus to the resource um a lot of what I talk about with gravel roads is a lot is very similar to what I talk about with contractors in just general erosion control and trying to prevent soil movement on any sort of construction site or, or active job site. Um, but when we're dealing with gravel roads, we're trying to make sort of an exposed soil condition stable so that it, it is less prone to erosion um, than it's uh, you know sort of just a, an open site of similar size might be. One of the other features that makes gravel roads or any road difficult is that they're a linear feature and they're not <clears throat> they're not so confined. They tend to go across watersheds. They tend to go across resources and uh, you know sort of span a, a long area. So one of the key principles that we discuss in selecting and really correcting any issue with gravel roads is has to do with the power of water because water 
is what is it's the power of water that's affecting the roadway so water power is affected by a number of different things like volume um the the ability of soil to infiltrate um and the ability for water to be stored in, in some other way but when we create linear pathways it tends to speed up water so while i don't intend this to be any sort of math lesson um or engineering piece uh, and if there's any engineers in here i'm sorry for my I sim my simplified explanation of this concept but um but essentially the the, the power of water is is a, the the velocity times its depth so when you increase the water's depth and it's moving um that increases the power of water and when you increase its speed that increases power so a couple ways that we increase the power of water is through by by taking some sort of flow path that is spread out which has very low energy um, and confining it to a channel or putting it putting more volume into a small area which um, gives it more erosive power to to move things around and this is a concept that is readily observed on the landscape so our streams and you know headwater streams from wetlands and all that stuff they they follow a predictable path from sort of a sheet flow to small rills to larger um, gullies and those gullies turn into stream channels and and other things uh you know further down the line as more volume is added to that section of stream system so it's just a smaller scale typically that we're dealing with but the same power of water um, that forms the natural landscape. So um, that kind of leads us to what are we trying to do with gravel roads? And um, and a little bit of it, a little bit of our trouble here has to do with the history of gravel roads. So um, I, I sort of, in a way, stole this from a, a colleague of mine, Dave Roke, who's just a, a great mentor and, and super knowledgeable person. He's the former soil scientist. Um, but he kind of break, always broke it down into we're, we're looking to provide um, two main functions, which is rideability and access and safety. You know, the, the, you want to be able to get there without damaging vehicles and you want emergency vehicles to be able to access the houses and, and all those, those functions of a roadway. But roadways also are an important, if, if done correctly um, and, and designed and, in, and particularly maintained, um they can be important features on the landscape in protecting water quality over something that's unmaintained or um that uh that attention isn't paid to the detail of the design and, and the the layout of that road and so a good road will be designed to support those traveling vehicles um and provide the stable drainage from the power of water so just a key, uh, one of the key concepts of a roadway is that there is a pitch to, then there's a grade to the, the travel way of a road so that the water maintains a sheet flow on the driving surface and keeps it as low power as possible. And then the ditches themselves would then carry, historically just carry that, that volume of water that's collected off of the roadway to uh, a discharge point. And so there's certainly a risk with losing material off of the surface of a road, but when it's graded and compacted and, and, and sort of the proper material is in place, there won't be a, a tremendous amount of movement of that material. And so we do focus a lot of stuff on, on ditches because there's a lot of power of water that can be uh, in, in ditch systems and, and that drainage network. Um, Unfortunately, many of us probably find that we're not in a position to build an ideal road. Um, we're not in a position, um, you know, maybe even to have the the proper width or right of way to, to construct something to more of a modern standard. Um, and certainly not the money to to do that because it's an extremely expensive thing to, to build a road from the bottom up um, brand new. And many of our roads across the state of Maine, their origins were not as some constructed roadway. It was, it was as uh, many people in my circle call it, it was, it's the gravel carpet to camp. 
And so it was just the way that people got there. And over time, you just go like, oh, that's a soft spot. We need to throw some gravel there. And so we're just kind of throwing material in place and moving it around to try and flatten it out. Um, so there was never, they were never engineered to be full-time, um, you know, travel ways. So we, we are kind of at the, the mercy of the soil conditions of the locality in which that road was put to begin with, which may not always be the best location, um, but we do have to sometimes make do with what, what we have. Um, Ideally, if we're going to build a new road or, or sometimes if we're trying to correct an issue, it's important to understand what the what the road should um, you know, ideally look like to to maintain all of that, the structure and maintain its features. Um, primarily underneath the surface, um, you're going to find in, in those built roads a good base layer and that base layer is typically going to be constructed um, of 12 to 18 inches of material that is open draining, usually has a large, larger aggregate. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, where And that will sort of provide your bearing support and base for the, the driving surface, which will have a different gravel material that's used um, to, to keep water from draining through it and, and compact to a, a nearly impervious surface. Um, so that surface layer generally over the top of, uh, you know, four to six inches of uh, compacted um, surface gravel. And so you notice also there's a couple of notes on the side about um, crown or super elevation. And that's really the, the slope at which the road surface will maintain a good sheet flow with a gravel surface. Um, so the recommendation is 4% for that slope to maintain um, a crown or a super elevation and a super elevation is just a uh, drainage that goes across the entire road surface to one side and that's typically used on on turns and things like that where you wouldn't split the the crown and have the drainage going in two directions um, another really neat feature of to me at least of this diagram in particular of, of a road is it's not the you know, main DOT state highway kind of specification. And it has a really important piece that many larger roads nece can't necessarily incorporate all the time, which is using the natural buffer or you see on the, the left hand of your screen where there isn't actually a ditch on that side, because sometimes we don't need to collect the water and we can let stuff just sheet off into uh, a wider area so it will actually be just soaked into the ground and won't actually run off anywhere so um one thing that we we always think there should be ditches on both sides but but sometimes that's not the best course of action and just using sheet flow and, and that moderated energy of water that's off of the road rather than collect can be a really good tool uh, a little bit about materials before we move on to some sort of common problems and um and water quality and all that. And, you know, I have, I did kind of skip over a lot of the, you know, issues kind of assuming that there's some basis or baseline on, on what soil does to resources. But, um, you know, there's the chemical impacts that I talked about with phosphorus and, you know, impacting algae growth and freshwater resources there. But also um, there's sedimentation or smothering of habitat that can happen and, you know, especially for certain fish species that require, you know, they lay their eggs in an area a certain time of year, uh, sediment washing in over them can kill an entire age class of fish. Um, so it, it can be acute, but it also is over time, there's a, a, a big impact too. Um, so it's, it's a little bit hard, um, you know, being in this sort of Zoom format to, to pose too many questions. So normally I'd, you know, ask the, the, the uh, the trick question that everyone knows, you know, ask to see this jar of marbles and, um, you know, is the jar full? And um, so in the technicality, it's not. So there's airspace in between where those, where the marbles line up. And so one thing with aggregates or, or stone or whatever you would find in a mix of gravel that would be represented sort of by those marbles is there's always space in between that could be fit by smaller materials. So if I took that jar of marbles and we filled it with sand, you know, we'd find that we could fit a lot of sand still in that jar. 
And then even then that sand particle will be of a size that there'll be a particle that will fit in between the spaces of that, um, and which is usually a, a silt particle. And so the type of gravel you pick is dependent on what you're trying to make that gravel do. So the base gravel is generally larger aggregate and it should be crushed type material that can, can not lock together nicely. Um, sometimes you can get away with using bank run gravel, which is a, you know, usually whatever's dug out of the ground, this rounded stone and things, but the, the angular stone really does lock a lot better um, and, and support better. Um, and then in the base you have, in that chart there, it talks about the base material and the percent of each aggregate size or each um, particle size. Um, and there's a sieve thing, so I'm not gonna get into the details there, but in a road base, there's really almost no silt in it. Um, so that number 200 is a sieve size that that brings up silt. So it's zero to 7% silt, very little silt. So it, it actually does drain water out. Um, so the, the role of that base layer is not only to support the weight of the traffic and, and sort of spread it out a bit, um, but also to not to make sure that water doesn't get trapped underneath the road. Um, and so a free draining material there can can help make sure that the water doesn't get trapped and you don't get all the heaving and, and you know impacts from freeze and thaw cycles with water trapped under the, the riding surface. Um, on the surface gravel, on the other hand, it's generally a smaller aggregate. So generally you're gonna see all the material will be less than two inches, typically a, a three quarter or one inch minus gravel is, is what we see out there. Um, but the difference with that one is it does have silt in it and it does have some slightly different percentages of material, um, but the seven to 12% fine, they'll say tw seven to 12% fines or seven to 12% passing a 200 sieve uh, for the silt. That's really the glue, that's the binder of your surface that when everything's compacted, that fills in that final layer of void in the sand size particles to give you a completely compacted, almost almost you know 100% impervious surface. So water just can't go through it, it will run off. Um, and then we grade it in such a way so that runoff is, is maintained in as, as low a profile as possible. Um, so kind of looking back at that same thing, in a way, in this diagram, there's another tool that's tied to that surface layer and crown, which is splitting the volume of water in two different directions. So there's different ways you can approach it. We could super elevate or that roadway with all drain, say, to the left. And that means 100% of that runoff or that, that volume of water is going to the left side of the road. Um, but if we crown a road in the middle at a 4% or a um, half an inch per foot, then we maintain sheet flow and we split the volume in half. So half of the water is going one direction, half is going the other direction. And that main, that reduces the potential power of that water when it does move within the ditch system as well. All right. Oh, sorry. That's just a picture of my dog digging in the backyard. Um, <laughs> I kind of forgot that was in there. Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so my next piece really is kind of just trying to jump in on some of these common problems that, that we hear about and see all the time um, and try and provide a little bit of context of like, I'm seeing this thing, what's the problem? What's the easy fix? Um, you know, all these, these ties in either affect one or the other, but most um, will, will definitely affect water quality. If soil has the ability to move, water quality will be um, something of concern. There are some tools to to capture soil that's moving, but we want to put most of our effort into the prevention side, which is proper design and, and um, maintenance of that roadway. Um, so one common thing, right, that we see, especially first thing in the spring, when, when the frost is coming out of the ground, see rutting of roadways, um, or you have a soft road. And that is, is typically, a, you know, any sort of soft road or, or water, you know, water is the enemy of roads. So when, when water sits in a roadway, that's what can start to lead the process of degradation. Um, so that rutting is a sign of a poor base material in your road so that it doesn't have enough support underneath it to keep 
the aggregates from your surface gravel from pushing down into the material underneath. So that action of driving over it pushes pushes the stones and things down, but leaves the fines sort of up, and that stuff gets mixed with water, and you know ends up um, you know pushing and rutting the road. So while it can also be a sign of other issues, that's commonly one of the things in Maine, just because of the history of our roads not being built, and they just kind of made the whatever the easiest way to get to those properties or to get to the destination that they're trying to, to get to. Um, Another way that can happen too is just the road is lower than, uh, or the, and the base is lower than the water table. So you just have water sitting under the road. Um, and that could just be because the road is lower than the, the ground near it, or that you do, or you're just sort of going through a wet area and the, and the water level is higher in the road. So it kind of seeps up through the pores um, and uh, creates that, that softer condition. Um, you know, poorly drained soils are, are often um, the, the leading cause because those softer, finer soils don't let as much water into the ground, but they also kind of, they tend to like just suck up all the stones and all the other stuff and, and keep you with a, a, you know, loose soil surface. So the ideal way to deal with any of these, if you have like a base, you know, base, um, and this is just a consistent issue is to reconstruct a proper base, but that's really out of price range for, for most road associations that I've ever talked to, to be able to actually reconstruct it to, um, you know, especially given the length of these roads. And um, so another way is you can just, you can sometimes build up the elevation. So you get that positive drainage off of the road and into either, you know, a ditch system that's set a little bit lower to help keep that water moving away. Um, Another really awesome way, which you can see in the picture from a colleague of ours, Josh Platt, um, is using um, woven geotextiles, which is a, essentially a, it's a it's a, a fabric, a woven fabric um, that's really strong, and it comes in these really big rolls, um, and it can be quite expensive to to buy the rolls, but. Um, essentially, what you do is you you lay them out on the road and put new surface gravel on top of them, and it tends to fix the the issues with a not having a base in the road. So it provides that separation, doesn't allow water to easily come up through that material, but also provides um, a separation that prevents your aggregates and your surface from pushing into anything softer below it. So it doesn't, it lets the water, um, you know, shed off, doesn't allow the water to come up from underneath and provides that bearing surface spreading out the weight of vehicles and things over a much larger area. Um, and so that photo there is from, uh, so Josh is working with some road associations and um, you can see th this road association was doing it in phases. So they were doing essentially like a roll of fabric a year um, in the, the most critical areas first and you can just see very clearly just from that one one action where the fabric ends um, and sort of the condition of the roadway in those two different locations all right so get on to some of these other one. similarly with you know just muddy and slippery surfaces usually that's it's always has to do with drainage um you may if you've been to any sort of gravel road thing that we've put on you know there's there's three things that that cause, um, you know, the three most important things when it comes to maintaining a good drivable and, um, you know, uh, a good road that doesn't pollute uh, water quality. Um, it's drainage. Second thing is drainage. And the third thing is drainage. You know, it's all about water. So um, soft spots is, is usually a sign of drainage or some other reason that the water is not moving where it's supposed to in the way that it's supposed to uh, or that we want it to. So it could just be that in these areas, you don't have enough ground or, or the last time, um, you know, a grader operator came through, they, you know, just went down the center of the road and just flattened it out. And now the water's sitting in the, in the middle of the road and people driving through it kind of make a pothole and the water sits there even more. Um, or sometimes in the winter, the you know, especially narrow roads, when if you got a plow driver that's coming down one lane, um, you know, it's pretty easy, especially in the spring um, when when there's 
when the the road is thawed a little bit to just completely plow that plow, plow that crown right off and have water sitting into the road there. Um, so it's it's really a sign of a drainage issue. So often you could correct it with a crown if there's no underlying reason that water should be affecting that part of the roadway, like a you know it goes through a, a wet area or or some fine soils or something else. But um, so you can just often reslope and recrown those areas, but it may also require that you bring some new or better surface material in. Um, because another reason that the water could be sitting there and affecting it this way is that the surface gravel that you got or is on there just has too many fines in it, and that kind of makes for a muddy, slippery situation. So that's that seven to twelve percent. It would be sort of on the either on the high end of that or or exceeding that that twelve percent. Um, dust is related to um, so dust is erosion and. But this kind of kind of erosion, we most most commonly associate with with health and also safety. Um, so dust dusty road conditions, um, and especially in construction, we talk about this a lot, um, can be a, a real safety issue for the traveling public. If you know there's trucks driving down a road and it's all dusty and and um, somebody's behind them and they don't see that the truck had stopped, that can be uh, pretty jarring, um, but also breathing rocks is bad. And I think we all kind of agree that we probably shouldn't be breathing that stuff in. And, um, you know, the, there's there's a lot of damage that can that can happen by just breathing dust on consistently. So we don't want to have that. There's ways that we can deal with that. This is a sign also of too many fines. Um, and so the road is not gluing together appropriately with that gradation. Um, and so it's just there's too much too much small stuff, and that gets up into the air when uh, when uh, tires and things drive over it. Um, there are treatments that you can do to roads um, aside from just replacing the surface material with a better material. Um, commonly, calcium chloride is used or other chloride materials um, because of its ability to sort of form a crust and sort of absorb some atmospheric water. It does tend to sit in those situations and not move too much, but you know, more and more we do see concerns with calcium, or sorry, with chloride pollution, especially with headwater streams. So um, there are some like different polymers and um, you know, more biodegradable type things that have been being used out there. Um, there's just a kind of a variation in how often you have to apply that stuff for it to be effective long term. Potholes, everybody's favorite. And I, I would normally have get a show of hands how many people have potholes, but I know that every single person in here that is on a gravel road has a pothole. I have a pothole in my driveway right now. Uh, you know, so this is a super common thing to show up. And unfortunately, what happens with potholes is they tend to reoccur. And, and a lot of this is due to the way we will try and fix these issues once they start to show up. Um, and so once again, you know, potholes are a sign of poor drainage in the roadway. So it could just be a, a you know, crown issue. It could be material issue. It could be those other things that dealt with drainage. It's just not able to get off of the surface somehow. And so what happens with potholes is the vehicles driving on the road, when there's some water sitting in the road, the energy of the, the tires hitting the water in the road splashes out the finest particles from that area. And so what that does is it opens up pore space within the sands and the gravels, um, or sorry, in the, the stone uh, or aggregate, which allows water, more water to sit in there. And so every time a, a tire goes over that area, it splashes more of the fines, more of the glue that's supposed to hold the surface of the road together. And so you essentially end up with this area where all of the fines are gone, all of the all of the glue is gone, and you're left with just the 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 larger material, the the, the stone and the sand potentially, or or just you know uh, that smaller stone material and pebbles and things. And if you just fill that in with new gravel, 
that pocket of water is still under there. So that material starts to move its way through, the water sits back on top again, splashes everything out. So that's kind of what continually causes potholes in the same location is essentially that the the fines being splashed out left that that void where water could sit. And if we don't remove all of that material down to good sound material where the fines and the glue still exist and reincorporate everything, there's always going to be some some water drainage sitting in the road underneath the surface that can reemerge um, you know, as soon as as tires start hitting it again. So <clears throat> the the way we describe it is really you've got to you've got to get to the bottom of that thing you've got to cut it out um so you get if you're you have a good grader operator that that helps maintain your road um they can often get their grader at a depth that can cut underneath that and reintegrate the material um but a lot of times you might have to sort of really get that dug out um, get new material, kind of scarify what's there and mix it in with the material around it so that you um, get that continuous surface of, um, of graded and compacted um, impervious layer um, so that the water can't sit underneath and, and keep rearing its ugly head um, through, through those potholes. And that's a really great picture to me. It just really shows you how, you know, if you just threw some, some, find some material back on there, there's going to be that pocket of water that's sitting in between all of the particles, all of the uh, the pieces of stone that's going to keep your issue reoccurring. Um, all right, so I will also give another shout out that many of these things that I'm talking about, there's in the gravel road maintenance manual, it goes into some detail about a lot of these things. It was last updated in 2016, and I'm... Hey, John, sorry to interrupt. Just yeah. want to give you your warning. I awesome. missed the 20 minute. We're at uh, 15 minutes now. That's good. I'm, I'm doing good on time. I'm, okay, I'm not excellent. lingering too much. So it's... Okay, great. Um, but but yeah, there's there's some additional tools. So this is... Some of these are like part of, part of that book. There's some troubleshooting guides. There's some just basics starting from scratch. There's also some um, assessment tools that you can kind of use a checklist to kind of go through and maybe assess where your most vulnerable areas for water quality might be, but also for rideability and for other things. So you can kind of come up with a game plan on what what's most important or uh, what what's the what are the first things you want to fix. Kind of come up with a prioritization plan. Um, so I'll hit a couple more of these and then we'll we'll kind of do some questions and uh, hopefully. Um, you guys got some good, good questions for me. I do like a good challenge, um, but so loose gravel is another one. You know where where you might be driving and you know you're kicking up gravel. You know, in the especially rear wheel drive vehicles. You know, you hit a little too hard and you kick up that gravel in the back. Um, a good gravel road surface shouldn't do that if it's if it's good material and it's graded and compacted properly um, because it should really solidify together quite well and you know i always use a test um walking gravel roads to see if if the compaction is good on that it's just kind of scrape my boot and see you know is it just a little bit of stuff that moves but you know it should be pretty solid almost like pavement if if done really well um, so any of that loose stuff could be any number of things, probably too many fine, you know, your material either just, it doesn't have the glue, it's like too much sand or too much of any of those individual components to, to not really knit into all the smaller spaces at the right proportions to, uh, to make it a solid surface. Um, winter sand getting on roadways or, or just a road that you just, you have a little gravel borrow pit for the road and it's just some sandy material that you just use and it's easy and it's free, but, you know, especially for surfaces, it can be really worthwhile to get the good manufactured, um, you know, specified stuff that's going to pack well. Um, some of that other stuff can be useful for base material or for, um, you know, a little additional support underneath, but, you know, a good, a, a good surface gravel goes a long way. And there's other materials too that I should mention that we can that 
can be used and are, um, depending on where you're located, may or may not be as readily available because these are, these are mineral soil products, you know, like any gravel is a soil. It's just a mix in a specification that provides some certain engineering, you know, um, you know, uh, ability to that material. And um, so we do allow for the beneficial reuse of reclaimed asphalt. Um, so that can be a good surface material in certain locations. Um, you know, so reclaim would often historically be used on maybe some steeper areas. Um, you know, when that's all packed together, it does tend to, um, you know, hold pretty well. Um, but there are concerns about, you know, material, you know, it's oil and asphalt and all that, um, that some people do have concerns about using that material, especially near resources. Um, and then another material we've seen a lot of use of recently in central Maine is bluestone gravel. And um, it's, uh, it's just a, it's a different origin of, of sort of parent material stone in it. And it, the way it breaks apart, if, Kind of makes these flex if anyone's used the you know stone to blue stone dust before that's kind of a component of it it's like crusher dust and some other things that really packs really well together and, and resists erosion really really effectively as a material um so a lot of the lakes in, in the central main area because there's just availability of that type of stone um have been switching to that just because it's it's really exceptional at holding in place and, and gluing together uh, washboarding is something that I, t I actually tend to see more on, you know, it's something you see if you ever go up to like the Golden Road or, or anything like that with a lot of truck traffic and stuff. Um, but you definitely see it on camp roads too and smaller roads. And that is from essentially too much fines in the road uh, material. So it's a material issue, but also a speed issue uh, where the, the, Vehicles are kicking up a lot of that dust and it creates that washboarding um, where the tires kind of like skip across the top of those um, those pieces. So um, ultimately, it's, a, it's too many fines in the road because it's getting picked up as dust. And um, so you may need other materials or just a replacement or, or to do, uh, you know, reintegrate some, some better material into what you have there to, to try and limit that impact. Um, but regular grading um, can also help with that and, and doing it multiple multiple times a year seasonally and you know making sure that it gets rolled afterwards so it's not just graded and left left open so that that dust isn't um, you know everything's not packed together so it kicks up easier um, and then I'll what I'll probably do is I'll I'll hit this one really quick because this is another common one um, and then we'll we'll maybe switch over to some questions and. Um, so another one is just when when you have a steeper slope, this tends to happen. Uh, but we just get water running down the road, and one of the design features of the road that I mentioned is we want to try and sheet that water off into the the sides of the road, either into vegetation um, naturally to diffuse that and absorb the water, or into a ditch, and that ditch could go to some energy diffusing structure. But you'll see that typically because of crowning issues where the water can actually start to run down. And that may be from other conditions like rutting, um, where a soft road, where going down a hill, that water just takes the little path of least resistance down the tire rut. Um, so if you have a long stretch, there can you can do things like a broad-based dip, which is really just a really wide kind of speed bump at an angle that, uh, can help to kick the water off to the side if it does start to go down the roadway to things more likely to be associated with, with driveways, honestly, at this point, with the open top culverts that you see in the lower right and the, um, and the rubber razors that you see there as well, which is like a conveyor belt sandwich between two by sixes, pressure treated two by sixes buried underground to, you can drive over them. They just kind of flop over when you drive, but they um, divert the, any water that's in the roadway flowing to, to this edge. Um, but there's a lot of techniques to do that. Um, with ditches, since they're going to receive the water and have a lot of power to them, really, we don't want to be leaving ditches disturbed. Um, 
we should be doing one of two things really i guess there's another category that we won't really discuss with you know but um which is more like paving but it's not not something that's going to be good for water quality anywhere um you either want to vegetate or you should be doing something with rock and there's you see the the picture of the blanket there in a ditch but you also see some riprap and some grass um in in some of the other pictures uh blankets and even to a degree check dams, which should be really considered temporary, are, are potentially ways to slow the water down so that you can get a chance for vegetation to grow. But we shouldn't be just leaving them um, you know, to their own devices because that water will channelize and that's gonna be very, uh, very erosive. So one last thing I'll point out with that is we need to, before we put any ditches into resources, we wanna make sure that we do two things. We want to take the energy of the water away so it doesn't cause a, a erosion within the resource or or cause a um, any any embankment failures or or things like that because we're adding more volume more quickly to that resource than it was designed to handle. Um, but the other thing is to capture the sediment so that next to the resource, don't go directly into it. Put a put a like a sediment trap, which would typically just be like a plunge pool that would slow the water enough for the sediment that might be carried within the ditch to drop out before that water actually goes into the resource. Um, so yeah, do you, is that, no, am, just, I, am I at time here? Now you're at your five minute warning. Okay. So just one last thing about needs ditches. to leave at 7.30, I just wanted to- One last thing in. about ditches before I go to the, uh, the questions is the shape of a ditch matters. And, and so, it all has to do with how much surface area the water is touching of the ground. Um, and so if you make something that is a triangular shape or a V-shaped ditch, which is the top picture, as you add volume of water to that shape of a ditch, the, the depth of that flowing water increases very quickly because it doesn't have a lot of area to spread out and it's not touching as much surface area of the soil that helps slow it down or the, or the grass or the, the rock that's in the ditch. When you do something like the bottom, the segmental one there, I, it's the U-shaped ditch. That is really the most efficient ditch shape for preventing um, the buildup of flows by adding more volume to it or more power by adding volume to it. It just allows as the, as the volume is added to that ditch, there's more space for it to continue to spread out. And as it spread out, it gives you the maximum amount of surface area touching um, the the water water um flowing across it which slows it down so um you know definitely if you have the choice between doing something that's got a very deep v kind of shape and a u kind of shape always pick the u shape because that will by itself limit some of those other things now i didn't have enough time to go into these other pieces with stream crossings and culverts um but i'm happy if we do the the four hour field and all that stuff We'll get into probably more culvert stuff than you'd ever want to discuss, um, but there's def definitely differences with uh, drainage structures versus streams and resources. And um, these couple pictures here are just a couple of those plunge pools or, or sediment traps that I mentioned, where we can take the energy out and capture sediment um, before it reaches a resource um, and let it kind of go across the ground and infiltrate. So. Um, Oh, and compaction is the number is what leads to most culverts failure because uh, you see this one is lifted up here. So good compaction is key. All right, I'm just skipping. If anyone wants this presentation, you can um, I just, I don't want to go too too long here because I tend to, to get into too much detail on some things. Um, but okay. I can also help with permits and stuff like that. But um, here's, I'll just kind of leave this up if anyone's kind of curious. Um, about that and has a question, we can address it in this sec this, this section here. Okay. So happy to take questions. Great. Yeah, and you could send me the presentation if you want, and I could also make that available on the website with the, the video of your talk. Cool. You know, that sounds great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'll just, uh, quickie little reminders. I posted again in the chat. Um, the recording of this talk will be available on the Waldo County Soil and Water website in our news and blog page within a week. 
and I put the link to that page in the chat. Um, and in case, and also I, I posted, reposted, I put three times, I posted the link to the gravel road manual in the chat. So everybody should be able to access that. And um, and then one final reminder, if you'd like to receive one credit CEU to renew your erosion control certification for the year, please enter your name and email address in the chat and John will follow up with you. Okay, so there's one question in the chat that I'll read. And then um, if anyone would like to ask questions after that, after John responds, just remember to unmute yourself and we'll go from there. And of course, if you need to leave at 7.30, uh, we'll understand. Uh, so Paul Warburg uh, asks, I uh, he says he collects money for camp roads, approximately 4,500 per year, which in itself is an undertaking, I can imagine. This covers about one mile of gravel road. Are there any helpful funds available? Um, it depends. <laughs> um, so I guess, did I, maybe I missed it. Did he say what? where he's located no he did okay so I, I guess i'll generally i'll just talk about potential funding so there isn't any sort of state fund or or any anything that really helps provide for for maintenance of gravel roads um you know to especially to private roads so Certainly, there's there's resources for for public gravel roads, and the I would definitely give a shout out to the main DOT local road center. Um, and so, for any municipal folks out there, Pete Coughlin, really great resource over at DOT, and and his you know his team over there is really tasked with um, you know assisting municipalities with with a lot of this stuff. So. I can't really speak on that end. He he would probably, if it's a municipal thing, there there may be something that uh, might be available that I'm aware unaware of. Um, there's also there is a stream crossing grant that DOT is now managing on um, for municipalities also, but unfortunately, it doesn't it doesn't include private um, roads or crossings. So the it depends part is there are potentially funds and and media and I were kind of chatting a little bit about this prior to the presentation. Um, the 319, um, Section 319 of the Clean Water Act um, provides some funding for planning and implementation of watershed scale uh, projects for water quality, primarily aimed at non-point source pollution. And so they're, depending on the watershed, there are some some criteria that need to be met and some sort of public participation things with um, you know watershed surveys and kind of getting a, an idea of what the issues within a particular watershed are and once the planning process sort of identifies issues that can unlock funding for implementation and, and correction of chronic issues and other things in in um, those watersheds where where the watershed plan has been created. So essentially, there's a planning document that helps um, provide a framework to correct watershed-wide issues. Um, so there may be funding available available and private roads in those watersheds that have done that plan um, can access funding to do stuff like that. It, there's just nothing across the board that I'm aware of to say like anyone, any private road could apply for this because there is um, a bit of a bit of pre-work to to sort of establish the watershed priorities and kind of come up with the list of, of issues that need to be corrected um, and identify those things so that funding can be made available to fix them. Um, right, okay. okay. I'd, I'd just like to jump in if I could, Medea. Yeah, and, go ahead, know, Brian. Uh, of course, Unity Pond is, did complete their watershed protection plan, and we we are planning a uh, three nineteen grant application here in the in the spring coming wow. up in May. Actually, is the deadline. So anybody in the Unity Thorndike, Troy Burnham, uh, I think it extends out to Freedom, and 
we 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 are going to submit a a grant proposal here in the spring. So, and if anybody would like to sit around and talk about that, I'll, I will hang out here at the end, and we can we can discuss that and what we have what we have for plans going forward. Yeah, that, that's great that you've got that underway, and I would definitely say. You know, the earlier the better. If somebody just does have issues, you know, definitely bring it to Brian's attention because it is, in many ways, uh, you know, a lot of that responsibility to to identify and do the planning and all that stuff is is really at the local level, with the watershed level. Um, so it does require some very dedicated folks to make that happen. Okay, great. Uh, any other questions, folks? Go for it. Just remember to un unmute. John, could you talk a little bit more about the bluestone and maybe also the reclaim? Uh, and when you, you say reclaim, are you talking asphalt reclaim or just reclaim yeah. from gravel roads? And what would the impact be, let's say, 250 feet from a shoreline in the area? Is that allowed as far as reclaim? Yeah, so there's no there's no limitation on the use of reclaim. Um, certain, I guess, just standard precaution in my mind is like it probably not best used right over stream you know areas where you might reasonably think some of the stuff could easily move to a resource um it's not to say that there won't be any limitation in the future not that there's any discussion of that but um right now we don't it is an, an approved material on the on the asphalt reclaim or um, you know so the bluestone, um, I wish I had a good picture of, but it's it's really very much the same. Uh, the, so you, the the one one of the places that um, pretty much supplies almost all the the projects that I see in Central Maine is through Pike Industries. They their pit they have they have access to that type of stone, and I guess I'm not I'm not a geologist, so if anyone. Um, wants to jump in on that but i guess what i understand is it's one of the important parts it's sort of like a, a metamorphic uh stone which makes it sort of break in a very distinct and distinctive way that locks together better than like a a typical manufactured gravel product that has like sands and silts which are more like blocky round kind of particles they're more like plate like um pieces which just really lock super well um, but the the seven to twelve percent fines still still applies there. The the mix essentially mimics that that surface gravel spec that I shared. It's just made out. It, its origin material is slightly different, and um, you know it's not made from from sand and stuff like that. It's it, they take like it's for their fines. They take like uh, the crusher dust from from manufacturing the um, the crushed stone and that those fines and and that. Um, what they call it? They call it like stone flour sometimes. It's just like very, very fine stuff that helps pack together super nice. Um, but beyond that, I, you know, it's the, the specs and everything else are, are more or less the, the same for your percentages. And um, I know Ken is Kennebec County Soil and Water District does a lot of those. So, um, maybe an opportunity to reach out to them. I had a contact for um Dale Finseth. No, not... What's that? Dale Finseth is the contact at Kennebec. Yeah. So, so yeah. I'm sure too if if you were really looking for it, I'm sure if if you reached out to myself or Medea that we could get you in touch with somebody who yeah. has some so associations too if because there's there's limited places where you can get it. So there's a trucking cost in some places that can be fairly significant when you're bringing, you know, tractor trailer loads of material to, to do a road. Um, but some folks have joined up together to like do like a, a single buy and sort of stockpile a little bit for use later. Um, so it is, and I will also mention that it is pricier than your typical like brown pack gravel. Um, surface gravel so it, it does I think some of it is really 
because of that any shipping cost because it's just sort of limited places the materials available sure. um so you say that this bluestone is really superior for it yeah for i outing. mean every okay. every person that i've talked to that's used it has just been singing the praises and i've been out to a lot of these sites um seven lakes alliance is another one in um the belgrades they almost use that for all of their 319 projects and things like that it's almost exclusively bluestone i don't even think they they do anything with regular gravel anymore because they've had such success next to water bodies and and in some really tricky areas that that they weren't able to handle before and i, I think it does also tend to hold the crown a little bit longer than some of the other ones too it just sort of keeps its shape thank you <clears throat> Okay, thanks, John. Any other questions? Could he, just, mm -hmm. could he just say something concerning uh, when you're in a slope to have the uh, ditches go out into the woods? Yeah, so yeah, sorry, I, I did kind of like really rush. I didn't really get at mo most of my ditch stuff that I was going to talk about, but that's a really great point. Um, so with any ditch, the longer the run or like the, the longer the water's going in one direction, the more force and more volume it picks up. Um, so one of the techniques that you can use to alleviate that is to basically split the water into smaller chunks and turn that water out into the woods. Um, you can't do it everywhere, especially with residential stuff. You know, you got to be a little bit careful about where you do it um, and selecting a good place that you can effectively do it without adding too much water to an area. Um, but if you if you turned out water, say like every couple hundred feet on on a steep slope, and even if it was a thousand feet long, the total amount of water in any one of those sections of ditch will only be what could accumulate in two hundred feet, um, versus you know the force that could be accumulated by a thousand feet is five times you know more volume of water. So generally, what that also does is it allows it's an it's often enough to allow for infiltration, but not affect the overall hydrology of that area. So it doesn't like take some area that wasn't wet before and make it wet because um, the, the volume is more or less just mitigated and split up into, into sort of smaller chunks that the, the land can actually absorb um, and, and manage under most conditions. Obviously there's extenuating circumstances. Um, with with any anything like that, um, you know, design limitations. Um, but they're they're a really useful tool for prevention of erosion because you're dealing with the volume. Um, you know, you're dealing with the source of the problem versus putting a band aid on it, which is a lot of what we do with rip wrapping channels and not. Um, you know, we're just dealing with the water's ability to actually touch the soil. Um, versus dealing with the overall volume or dealing with the, uh, you know, uh, how much force or how much power that, that water can build up as it gains steam going down a slope. So, yeah, great, great point about that. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I have a question, John, about your slide that's showing right now um, uh, for within 250 feet of a stream there is nothing in the box what does that mean okay yeah let me um so this is really split up into two categories and it all comes down to the um who regulates what so there's the state side of regulations um which is the natural resources protection act primarily nrpa um and that deals almost entirely just within in on over the resource and within 75 feet of those resources um main the dep rules are those resources are by definition so there's not like a map um it's just basically if if it meets the definition of a stream it's regulated as a stream under the law which is different than the town so the town under shoreland zoning they have a map and so to create that map, they had to start at a certain scale um, where they there was a known quantity with these resources. So they don't cover, the town doesn't regulate all of the same resources that the state 
Natural Resources Protection Act does. And they regulate it in a slightly different way um, through that zoning process um, where you talk to your local code officer. So most of those resources that are mapped at the town level are going to be your, I guess, more major resources. Um, and that's the 250 foot um, jurisdictional zone next to the resource, the, the quote unquote shoreland zone. Um, and so the shoreland zone does have a stream protection district and it's in many cases either 75 feet or 100 feet depending on the town because they can go they can be more strict than the minimum but i believe the minimum um, still is 75 feet for stream protection which is really your smaller first order or you know um, intermittent to first order perennial streams or the, the smallest ones don't get captured at the town regulatory level but they do fall under the definition at the state level. So there's not necessarily a jurisdiction at the town level for small streams beyond uh, to the 250 feet at all. If there were with streams at, at the town level, it'll be 75 or 100 feet typically. Um, but all, and that's only streams that are below the confluence of two perennial streams. So that, that's where they start is where two perennial streams meet. The town regulations would start mapping that as a stream. Mm -hmm. Everything downstream of that would be within that category. But the upstream stuff is not captured. So that's why you don't see anything in that within 250 for streams in particular. Wow. Complicated. It is different for rivers. Uh, rivers are regulated differently at the town level. And there would be a 250 foot zone right. around a river. And they define a river as, a, you know, a channel that drains a 25 square mile. It's a receives a 25 square mile drainage area. Mm -hmm. So it's like a it's a watershed calculation of how much drainage area. Once that channel matches that 25 square mile mark, that's where the river starts and the stream ends. Yep. So, okay. Thanks. Okay. Probably more than it. you ever wanted to know. Yes. Yeah, well, it's definitely complicated, but yeah, thank you. That does help. Um, we have a question in the chat from Beth Trehu, if, uh, Trehu, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. For pothole repair of crushed blue stone, is it possible for an amateur to sufficiently compact the repair without a mechanical compactor or steamroller? I think if I think if it's a limited area, I think that's totally doable. Um, I, for the majority of your, like if you're gonna do a big stretch of roadway, eh, that's that's gonna be backbreaking to, to try and be effective at that. Um, so for those repair areas, I think you can, you know, as long as you integrate the material well and you don't have any separation that could like, you know, two layers that aren't gonna bind together um, prior to compaction, a really helpful tool you can you know most rental centers you can go rent a plate compactor for a couple of hours you know they're, they'll help you load it and it's not super expensive those things are well worth the money um to rent even the little pogo um you can get these little like pogo stick things that like sort of jump up and down and compact it that way um the the limitation with hand compaction um is that even after doing it a lot um, you're not going to get that same level of compaction that you'll get with a with mechanical means, with a, any sort of vibratory or um, stuff like that. You, I've seen people try and, you know, use water to their advantage, you know, where you can sometimes spray it down and that kind of moves your fines, kind of push down into the material. But if you're trying to correct a pothole, that's probably not advisable. You don't want to get that water sitting under there. That's kind of the, the point of the what you're doing um so if it's small and you can dig it out with shovels or you know something like that to get underneath it kind of scarify it get new material in grade it really you know pack it as as go go pretty much as long as you you're like you think that you're like it can't be compacted any more than that and then maybe go for like a few more minutes um because i've seen some of the tests of compaction and even with the the compact and I wouldn't do this with culverts either I wouldn't do hand compaction because that just really wouldn't compact it enough um, but they'll go back and forth over it for five ten minutes with a plate compactor and they'll come in and test it and it still won't need the compaction requirements 
um, for some of the engineering stuff. So uh, I guess point being, if it's small and limited, it's it, probably no harm to do it. If it's bigger, um, you know, you probably want to at least think about renting some more, uh, something more like a plate compactor to really get that stuff whacked down. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, okay. Chad uh, has is asking a question and I'm afraid I'm going to have to be a killjoy for you, Chad. Any chance John can go back and cover the culvert slides? Um, I, I have an hour and 15 commute from my office to my home and I would like to, you know, leave <laughs> fairly soon. Chad, uh, I'll offer, give me a call tomorrow. Um, my numbers, my cell for work is 615-3279. I love to nerd out about culverts. So um, <laughs> so give me a call. We'll chat about culverts. And, and I even have some other video material for stream crossings in particular that I can send your way if, if that's helpful uh, to you. Feel free to send that to me too, John. Um, and I can share that through our website if you're yeah. if you're willing. Okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is there any way you is there any way you can transfer uh host duties over to me or um well the thing is, is that option? what I was also gonna say was that John and I spoke at the beginning about possibly after the actual official presentation, the formal presentation is done and our participants, our guests leave the Zoom. Um we were wondering about chatting with you, Brian, John. Andy, Steve, Charlie, whoever's interested about the prospects for organizing a field-based workshop later in the year. So I do want to, well, I was hoping we could do that after the formal presentation ends. So um, so I'm hoping that we can close up this, the questions portion of the program pretty soon here and do that. Is, are, you, are you open to that, Brian? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I'm just I'd like to anybody that wants to hang out, we can talk about the 319 applications if anybody has questions about that. So. Well, right. But the, so I'm trying to draw the questions to a close so that you, you know, yep. uh, us, you know, district and friends of Lake Winnicott can meet briefly with John. Um, yep. So I would, about... I would open that to anybody that would like to stay okay. tuned with that too. Okay, well. sure. So, All right. If that's okay um, with you, Media. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I just didn't want to bore people to death or, you know, just want to make sure people realize free to go at any time. Um, okay. And then Denise asked, how do we get info on the 60% matching funds grant? And Brian says, send us an email, Denise, and we'll send you info. Um, so let's see. And Beth says, so driving on it won't compact it, the gravel. John, is that right? It, it will, but it'll also rut it. And so yeah. the, it is possible, not necessarily recommended, just because the way we drive on roads tends to be in the same place. And then that sort of concentrates water on the surface of the road in those areas there. Um, so I guess ideally that, you know, right. at least when you not grade, mm -hmm. you, when you grade your road, you should ideally have somebody come and run a roller over that right after. So it just, that'll give you just a longer, longer um, surface if you, if you do that grading and, and it'll prevent fines from moving and potholes and some, a lot of those other things too. Yeah. Right. Makes sense. Okay, folks, I got to call it there. We've got, it's seven minutes till eight. So, um, uh, as I said, this was just a a a, uh, a a short offering to tempt you to to come back for more later in the summer. Um, so let's transition now from uh, John's formal presentation to a discussion focused more on uh, work that Friends of Lake Winnicook is currently engaged in, particularly around the 319 and also questions about holding a field-based workshop in either late spring or summer. Um, I, I think uh, Brian may not have been on yet when John was explaining that 
things are booking up fast. So early spring, not doable, but he has time available in May and June right now, but also uh, pointed out that July, August can be good because then you have a lot of folks uh, back for the season, um, you know, maybe seasonal camp owners and, and such like that. So, um, Brian, do you want to first talk about the 319? Uh, sure. You know, um, as as John was explaining, 319 is part of the Federal uh, Clean Water Act uh, that the state of Maine administers uh, with their shares, what, what Maine gets from that uh, grant process and a federal process. And in 319, this year, uh, we hope to be going after a lot of these grants over the next 10 years. But the, the first one, we, we have decided to focus on camp roads, town roads, ditching and also shoreline buffering. And uh, these grants could be worth up to $150,000 a year. Um, and, and primarily how they work is it's a lot of planning involved. It takes two years once you do apply. And if you are awarded the grant, you don't find out until I think the fall. And then uh, that money will, it still takes a whole nother year around almost 18 months to implement it. Uh, and how those grants work is it's a 60-40 match, meaning the uh, property owner would come up with 40. Let, let's just say we had a $10,000 project to make easy math here. And uh, the whole job cost $10,000. And the landowner would, would come up with 40% of that. And the, the grant would cover 60%. So I, I noticed Paul Warburg had a question about it. He said he collects forty five hundred dollars. Well, basically, that forty five hundred dollars could turn into potentially to ten thousand dollars spent, and, and that's how that would work. Um, the the road association would come up with four thousand, and the grant would match at six thousand dollars. So so it actually stretches your dollar quite quite a bit, uh, monies. And and this is great for road associations because you know over a two year period they could collect quite a bit of dues. And let's say you had a five thousand dollar project. You know, sixty percent of five thousand dollars is three thousand dollars that the state would match you, and and you would come up with two and and get a five thousand dollar project done. So, uh, and there are other other options. Uh, the state we're looking into at Medea. You sent me the information here a while back, and we we discussed it also. With Jen Jesperson, uh, there's some uh, I think it's climate initiative grant monies. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the title of it from the governor's office which is good for towns uh, and, and that addresses climate change. And of course, as you know, the storms we've been having and the stormwater runoff, uh, those grants can cover culvert issues and, and a few other uh, stormwater related issues. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so there are other options uh, for funding to, to fix, fix our gravel roads around the lake, you know? Nice. Yeah. Uh, excellent. You know, the biggest problem we have, I think, is 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 coming up with qualified uh, contractors enough to do the job and having uh, uh, graders. Uh, you know, I know that's a big issue, finding somebody that can run a grader and, and run it properly and be educated here on stormwater related issues. So that, that it, that's a big problem. We hope to work on that. Yeah. Um, so if anybody had, if there. anybody is interested in this 319 grant, please email us, get on our website, lakewinnicook.org. Our, our email address is there, contact us. Uh, deadline's coming up in May. So if, if you'd like to join, we, we've got to make it happen and, and get the planning uh, planning done and, and uh, get you on the list. Right. Yeah. And that's a great point that, you know, those the sort of the where the money gets spent is really, I mean, it's determined by the plan, but it's it's mostly identified by the the local folks, you know, that are, um, you know, on the ground and affected by this stuff. So that's really one of the benefits of that 319 process too. Um, kind of gets you talking to your neighbors about issues that affect all of you and um, locally, and you get to sort of figure out where that money would be best spent. Um, yeah. I will add on the contractor side because I do contractor training all the time. Um, I'll just throw out that I, we do have the certified contractor list, which is you know people that have been trained and have demonstrated some level of competency in 
um, doing that, but it's also what's required for doing soil disturbance for a contract to disturb soil disturbance within the municipal shoreland zone or the 250 feet. Um, essentially, there needs to be the contractors responsible for providing a certified person anywhere soils being disturbed within that 250 to make sure that, um, you know, it has to be somebody that's trained that can identify and say, yes, this, this uh, disturbance is, is adequately maintained and isn't gonna get into the water because we have good controls in place and to sort of prompt any changes if, if something isn't working or installed the way it's supposed to be. So um, it's kind of a responsible person requirement, but um, we do have a list and if anyone wants to get certified, if it's any contractors left on, that aren't on that list, um, feel free to, to reach out or we've got trainings on our website that you can take that initial certification training and um, qualify to, to be the responsible person in the shoreland area for any of the regulatory stuff. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, thanks. 